tonight. Trolling Mark Zuckerberg. Your user agreement sucks. Trolling Mark Zuckerberg. Why are you doing this? And the downsides of Little Pharma. A team of investigators is getting set to deploy to Syria to determine whether there was in fact a chemical weapons attack in the town of Douma. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons says the Syrian government and its Russian backers requested the investigation. President Trump canceled his plans to travel to South America later this week to oversee the response to the situation in Syria. This morning, he met with the Emir of Qatar, who said the two countries are committed to stopping terrorism funding. And, uh, me and the president, we see eye to eye that this matter has to stop immediately. We cannot tolerate with a war criminal, we cannot tolerate with someone who killed more than half a million of his own people. Yulia Skripal, the daughter of former Russian spy Sergei Skripal, has been released from a British hospital. In early March, the two were exposed to a military-grade nerve agent and nearly killed, which the UK, the US, and other governments have concluded was a murder attempt by Russian security agencies. Salisbury District Hospital says that Sergei Skripal won't be released yet. Although he's recovering more slowly than Yulia, we hope that he too will be able to leave hospital in due course. In response to reports that Yulia was moved to a secure location, the Russian embassy in the UK released a statement accusing the British government of isolating Yulia and blocking an impartial investigation. Leaders of the FARC, the former rebel group in Colombia, say the country's peace process could be in danger after a senior FARC member was arrested in Bogota at the request of the United States. Jesus Santrich was indicted Monday by a grand jury in New York for planning to smuggle a cocaine shipment worth $320 million to the United States. The arrest enraged FARC members and hundreds gathered outside the Colombian Attorney General's office to protest. Colombia's government signed a peace treaty with FARC in 2016, and the rebels agreed to stop hostilities and become a political party instead. Roy Moore is countersuing one of the women who accused him of sexual misconduct. The former Alabama Supreme Court judge and Senate candidate filed a lawsuit against Lee Korfman after she sued Moore for defamation. Korfman was one of several women who accused Moore during his Senate bid last year of sexual misconduct. She said that he touched her inappropriately when she was 14. Moore denies all of the claims, and his filing attacks Korfman's defamation suit as, quote, frivolous and groundless, and says it amounts to defamation of him. Isn't it Facebook's job to better protect its users? This is the most intense public scrutiny I've seen. Facebook collects the call and text histories of its users. After more than a decade of promises to do better, how is today's apology different? Would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Anyone been fired on that app review, review team? Your user agreement sucks. That's Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg getting theatrically taken to the woodshed by the Senate Judiciary and Commerce Committee for Facebook's many, many privacy scandals of the past year. As much fun as the Senate had dishing it out to someone younger and richer, it's not clear if Zuckerberg's testimony today and tomorrow will lead to any tangible regulation of Facebook. But that's not to say the government is powerless to hurt Facebook's business. In 2011, Facebook settled with the Federal Trade Commission over another privacy controversy, entering into what's called a consent decree. That decree lasts for 20 years and requires Facebook to protect the privacy and confidentiality of its users' information, among other things. Ashkan Sultani was the chief technologist of the FTC and worked on the 2011 Facebook investigation. It's kind of like probation, if you think about it in the legal system, where the company is on probation for doing something problematic. And then during the, this probation period, if they violate the rules of the probation, at that point there's an additional action which can incur fines or fees, etc. Now, the FTC is investigating Facebook to see if it violated that decree in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And the fines could be huge. 
For each violation of the consent decree, Facebook could be fined the maximum civil penalty of $41,484. Facebook estimates 71 million Americans had their information swept up by Cambridge Analytica. Facebook also admitted last week that malicious actors scraped the public information of 110 million users. Now, if those are each determined to be a violation of the consent decree, the potential fine could be trillions of dollars. Though a fine that large isn't likely. The political reality is that to bring anything that would actually impact Facebook would require a lot of political will, which doesn't exist right now in Washington. I think there it would be very hard to bring a multi hundreds of million dollar fine against the company. And anything less, I think, would be essentially a speed bump. At least one part of Zuckerberg's prepared remarks, though, do promise significant self-imposed change. To make sure no other app developers out there are misusing data, we're now investigating every single app that had access to a large amount of information in the past. And if we find that someone improperly used data, we're going to ban them from Facebook and tell everyone affected. Third, to prevent this from ever happening again going forward, we're making sure that developers can access as much information now. That means that apps that work with Facebook will now be restricted to only three pieces of information about you. You can choose to share more information with the app, but Facebook will require developers to sign a contract with Facebook if they want that access. But Facebook has yet to say exactly what that contract will entail. To Facebook's credit, that would mean a lot less information being shared about you than apps can get on other platforms. For example, on Gmail, on Roll.me, a service that automatically removes users from subscription email lists, collects information from your emails about what you buy and sells that information to its clients. Third-party Twitter app Uber Social has a privacy policy that says they share your personal information with third parties, like their business partners and advertisers. And Twitter's own user policy says they, quote, may also share information with other companies. But Facebook's promises aren't ironclad. That's why Zuckerberg was hauled before the Senate in the first place. We do not advise that anyone watching this video um, do what is about to be done here. On October 17th, Tristan Roberts, an activist and software engineer, injected himself with a solution that he hoped would modify his genes to cure his HIV. First, I want to dedicate this to all the people who have died while not being able to access treatment, even though those treatments were available. Tristan stopped taking conventional HIV meds two years ago because he hated the side effects. Instead, he tried an experimental gene therapy developed by a startup called Ascendance Biomedical. This therapy that you're injecting yourself with, what is it? How does it work? It's pretty much like a small circular piece of DNA that contains the instructions to create an antibody. They found this antibody being expressed by someone who wasn't taking their medicine. Who's they? NIH researchers. And this antibody, it binds to a part of the virus, and that prevents the virus from being able to latch onto my cells. It's giving my body the instructions on how to do it. So. Ascendance found that paper, took that research. How did they do that? It's the internet, right? It's like a lot of this information is becoming publicly available, and this is fueling the, the biohacking revolution. The first round of Tristan's gene therapy didn't work. But instead of going back on his FDA-approved meds, Tristan flew to Jacksonville, Florida, to try a modified dose. Ascendance Biomedical is run by one guy, Aaron Trawick. What's different about Ascendance compared to your typical biomedical company? We work directly with the public and try and maintain a public transparency that is necessary in order to facilitate greater and greater levels of access, both to our compounds as well as to uh, self-experimentation in general. Philosophically, the idea is to get new treatments to people faster than the FDA's approval process allows. Because that process, in the view of most biohackers, is slow, expensive, and corrupted by big pharma. Practically, it means Ascendance develops experimental compounds for people who want to be their own guinea pigs. Hello. 
Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Aaron is 28 years old, and he has no training in medicine. But he believes in what he's doing at least enough to test another gene therapy, this one for herpes, on himself at a biohacking conference. So I'll be taking off my pants, and I'm wearing underwear. How is Ascendance Biomedical funded? Where does the money come from? So we are primarily um, self-funded um, by our founders. Uh, I am a majority investor. Are you planning on getting any kind of return on that investment? Of course, there's a return on the investment, but it's more a long game than anything else. It's illegal to market something as medicine if it hasn't been approved by the FDA. But lots of chemicals are sold as research compounds, typically for science experiments. And even though companies can't market these for human consumption, legally speaking, people are free to try them on themselves if they want. What's different about what Tristan is doing? Because that's not a normal clinical trial. There's not that much different what Tristan is doing than what's already legally allowed by the FDA through the FDA's uh, compassionate use programs. It makes sense as a company to provide those therapies to individuals who want to uh, experiment. But just because you can experiment on yourself, does that mean you should? Karen Mashke is a researcher at the Hastings Center, which helped establish the field of bioethics. There were reasons that rules were put in place about which drugs for medical purposes can get on the market. And those rules were put in place because people were harmed by people, many who were lay people, who were concocting potions in their kitchens. And um, even if they weren't harmed, they were spending money on, on products that didn't work. So even if Tristan Roberts mm -hmm injects himself with this gene therapy and it works, is it good or safe for him to then go promulgating that therapy to well, other people? Well, that's the question. Is the claim that it, that thing you're calling it, actually had the effect that you're seeing? And that's hard to detect with one person. Nobody knows exactly how many biohacking companies there are, but they're out there, sometimes in nondescript strip malls like this one where Ascendance Biomedical rents space for one of their DIY labs. As lab manager, Ascendance hired Gabriel Lacina, a biohacker with a biology degree from the University of Washington. This is all like really basic lab stuff. It's like really straightforward stuff. We've got our mammalian cell incubator here, various devices for spinning things. This cool little guy is totally an airsoft rifle for shooting genetic material into the cells. Okay. This is minus 166. It's totally like a sci-fi movie. And uh, we got like a little back room. This is, this is where I store my nerds. <laughs> Biohacking is just kind of this thing that everybody has decided to use as a rebranding of, I'm doing science and I'm not doing it in a university. But at the end of the day, you're just doing science. Gabe is a diehard believer in open source. He thinks that the fruits of biohacking should be owned by no one and available to everyone, for free. One of the sweetest things about open source is if you do good work, people give you money. If somebody does, doesn't want to pay you, also should be okay. Telling somebody that they have to pay you, you're going to be sick unless you have money, is kind of not cool. So we're going to do something cool, and we're going to see what happens. That has led to friction between Gabe and Aaron, the CEO. What's your opinion of Aaron and of Ascendance Biomedical? <laughs> um, the boat floats. I'm just not 100% sure about the captain or the crew. The night before Tristan Roberts was supposed to inject himself with the second round of HIV therapy, we met up with the Ascendance Biomedical crew for dinner. It's like you want to make the thing so that everyone owns it and you want to own the thing. No, I want to make the thing so that everybody can benefit from it. Whatever gets it to the most people as quickly as possible and well, actually you know alleviate. The best way to get it to a lot of people, give it away for free. Unless and I don't think we've ever seen that open source has been able to do that. Oh, wow. Really? Products. Do you want to talk about Linux? Linux? <laughs> or if you give like, everyone like, the entire world access to everything that you're doing, then you leave the door wide open for unsavory and potentially negative players to take that technology and do things that can hurt themselves and that can hurt other people, but ultimately that can hurt the field. Okay, let's say that you, let's say that your treatment works, right, for you. Mm -hmm. 
who then has control over that? Well, ultimately it depends on the clinical development and how we're able to partner with nonprofits, NGOs, and hospital networks around the world. He's trying to say he does. The only thing that I'm saying here is that um, it requires a lot of different partnerships outside of our group. And so, are you going to be able to distribute it? Are you going to be the one who negotiates with the governments and the embassies and make sure that they can before. actually go into the I, country? But you like, are assuming executive control. I've not heard any offers to get involved in those processes by anyone else. Just fun story. Um, I'll not just not do lab work. <laughs> Maybe. We're working through it. By the next morning, things between them had gotten even worse. We're here at the lab where the therapy was supposed to be delivered today. It has not been delivered. We really just don't know what's going to happen. As it turned out, the HIV treatment wasn't ready for testing. And the fight over who should own Ascendance Biomedical's products boiled over. We caught up with Aaron later that day. So, um, what just happened? Gabriel, who served as our lab manager, and Justin, who served as the laboratory technician, have been effectively um, kicked out of the lab space, and the locks have been changed. A big part of the mission of Ascendance Biomedical is showing that this kind of research science can happen outside of the conventional institutional structures. I have to be honest, what we've seen so far this week doesn't inspire a ton of confidence. Well, the only way that I ever want the world to see us is as a never ending fight against these diseases. That night, the CEO carried his lab crew's personal equipment to the curb. And Tristan Roberts was forced to reconsider the merits of Big Pharma. So what do you think this says more broadly about biohacking? It's going to be hard to ever scale it up beyond sort of do it yourself kits where you maybe can do it to one person, but doing it to dozens, hundreds of people, it's always going to require investment, almost always. Are you going to go back on your antiretroviral medication, do you think? At least for a time. I've been off of it for two years, and it's probably for the best to suppress it for a while. A city of 7.4 million people, Hong Kong is one of the most expensive places in the world to live in. And it's one of the most expensive to die in, too. For the same reason, space. Just a few generations ago, ground burials were the preferred option here. But today, more than 80% of Hong Kong's dead are cremated to save money, time and real estate. Their ashes are stored in urns that are housed in niches in columbariums like this. Wei Geet Wa's mother is seriously ill in the hospital. So now she's searching for the final resting place that her parents reserved. When the Ways bought their two cubic foot-sized spots nearly 20 years ago, it cost them $25,000, a bargain by today's standards. A niche in the city's priciest private columbarium can cost you up to $380,000. And most Hong Kongers, like Cabby Chan, can't afford that. She is waiting for space for her grandfather's ashes at a public one, which costs about $350. The average wait time is four years. For a while, she secretly kept her grandfather's ashes at home, a taboo in Chinese culture. 
。呢把剑咧，家姐,姐知道我诶摆咗骨灰喺屋企啦，咁中国人就惊。誒、呃、有鬼神有魔噶，因為有骨灰喺屋企，咁啊佢啊求咗啲擺件俾我咧，我嚟劈邪嘅，可以可以刺到啲鬼嘅，係啦，咁我就安心啦。<笑> There were so many people in Chan's situation that the government had to start offering temporary storage for ashes in 2011, though that arrangement doesn't allow relatives to pay their respects to their elders. Chan has come up with a workaround. 咁通常會燒埋嘢俾阿爺，咁就叫阿老爺交俾佢咁咯。Only two public columbariums have been built in Hong Kong in the last six years. To alleviate the problem, the government has been pushing so-called green burials in eleven gardens of remembrance. 轉下轉下，嗰啲灰就跌出嚟嘅，係沿住條石坡一路行，一路行，係啦，灰就擺側邊，好係啦。Here, families can spread the ashes of their relatives, but just over 10% of Hong Kong's dead are laid to rest this way. There are other, more entrepreneurial solutions as well. Some companies are offering Hong Kong residents niches in mainland China, and soon, an app called Eye Veneration will allow its users to design graves in virtual reality. Or pay their respects to their ancestors with augmented reality. But Wei Gitwa has different plans. She wants to keep it simple. I, if I get people to die, I tell my daughter to you. You never do these kind of crazy things. Burn them, then I'm out of the house. Don't let them burn the ground. Burn the ground is very expensive. You just burn it down and burn it down. Remember the Monopoly man who crashed a congressional hearing last fall on the Equifax data breach? That was Amanda Werner, a political activist who works at a progressive advocacy group in Washington. But today, they took the day off to attend Zuckerberg's hearing once again in costume. Hi. How are you? you, Evan? Nice to see you. Amanda. Thanks for having us. Yeah, come on in. Tell me exactly what it is you're doing today. So today I'm attending Mark Zuckerberg's testimony in front of the Senate Judiciary and Commerce Committees,、um, and I will be going, you know, with my signature sense of style. So you're going to a committee hearing dressed as a Russian troll. Yeah, I think it's appropriate. You know, it's about Russian trolls. Okay. So what I tried to do is just kind of create a troll doll nude illusion. Um, I actually originally considered buying a bodysuit、um, that's just like flesh-colored, but I figured Senator Grassley would not be a fan of that. So I've got the the shirt and the pants, and then I've got a little jewel for my belly button. I thought I was gonna have to make this. I thought I was gonna just buy a normal wig and like put a bunch of hairspray and stuff, but you know, turns out there are a lot of options for trolls on the go.、Yeah. Um, <laughs> Honestly, this is a really tiny wig. It's kind of like a child size, so it can't actually cover all my hair. Well, so we're just gonna try to make it work. How do you get into a Senate hearing dressed like this? I've always been able to get inside the room. It's more what happens when I'm on the inside that's、right. a bigger deal. So we'll see. It, honestly, the key to doing this part is just not being embarrassed, and luckily, that's a skill I have. <laughs> I actually got this Russian soccer scarf, a little bit like a Russian babushka, just to like, you know. Get it, get it across. Oh yeah, this is a hundred rubles.、Um, if you recall from my Monopoly Man stunt, I had a moment where I wiped my forehead with a hundred dollar bill. So you know, the best comedians know to call back to their most popular material. <laughs> Here we are. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something. The, the jewel actually really makes it. I have to say, I, I, I was skeptical、really、of the jewel until I see the whole、oh, thing put together. No, yeah. Why are you doing this? Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but you know, one of the most personal ones is actually just this morning I found out that my data was exposed to Cambridge Analytica through this weird, you know, personality quiz app, and so I'm one of the 87 million Facebook users whose privacy was violated. So I'm attending not only to you know kind of call attention to this point, I'm also attending because I want to see what Zuckerberg says. This is how I choose to express my anger, and I think you know, honestly. You know, in 2017, 2018, I feel like 
you can burn out really easily if you keep getting angry. And so I think we have to find creative channels to you know, put that energy and use it to hopefully create a better world. I think part of what I want to do is use how ridiculous I look to highlight how ridiculous the things that the senators and Mark Zuckerberg are going to be saying. You know, because I think one thing senators often do here is they try to use this as their kind of moment in the spotlight, their time to be like hard on these terrible CEOs, and they don't actually back it up with any legislation. So what's it like in there? It's tense. They have it all set up basically so that the audience, the people in the crowd are really far away, unfortunately. So I'm not able to do what I was able to do last time, you know, kind of photobomb them the whole time. But so wasn't the whole point of this that there would be a shot of Mark Zuckerberg and then there would be this troll behind Mark Zuckerberg? Did that I watch was, this on that TV? That was definitely the ideal. But if you didn't get the shot, doesn't that mean this whole thing was kind of a failure? Oh, not at all. First of all, people are enjoying it. The media is paying attention. I think people are talking about it on social media. So as long as that's working out, I think it's good. Also, you know, frankly, I think seeing the number of creative protesters in there really shows me that Monopoly Man is working and starting to spread as a movement. And that's really my biggest goal. That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, April 10th. 